Well, we just want to come around God's Word because it's so important. And we are doing uh, aspects of Christmas, about the Christmas story and what takes place. And I want to speak to you this morning about the amazing gift that God gives us in the beginning of the journey, the journey to the birth of Christ. You see, there's never been any event like the birth of Christ before in the history of mankind. In that, God would come in human flesh so that we could know what he was truly like. Never, ever before that God came in human flesh. We call it the incarnation of Christ. And there's a reason for that. And man needs to know if God is real. Even atheists ask the question, God, are you real? Now, if an atheist was to ask God if you're real, there is kind of like that thought in the mind of a person that, God, are you true? Are you real? I could almost guarantee that everyone has asked that question at one stage of their life. And the answer is, yes, God is real. God is very real. God is very evident in the life that we lead. If we would just take the time to look and see the stars in the sky and look at the incredible creation, there is no possibility at all that it just happened as a random act. Totally impossible. And God has a purpose. You see, some people call God the great light, great knowledge, but we call him Jesus. We call him Jesus who was there at the very beginning where the word became flesh and he became amongst us. The journey to the birth of Christ, if we think about it, there are several people that are you know, spotted right through that, that journey. If you think of Joseph, you think of the, uh, the shepherds that are there, you think about the, the tavern owner. But I want to speak to you about Mary and her journey in the life of faith and knowing the reality of the power of God that took place. Elizabeth said this about Mary, you are the blessed woman above all all other women. That's a big statement. What about Mary's faith? Mary's faith. You see, folks, faith is the great divider to those who believe, they choose to believe, and those who do not choose to believe. And you say, is it really that simple to choose to believe or not to believe? Of course it is. You see, faith is one of those intangibles that sometimes can mess with our heads as we have this journey. Faith is the great divider, folks, for those who believe and those who do not. Faith is the giver to hope. You see, hope is a confident expectation of things to come, and faith is the giver to hope. Faith believes the truth. And hope waits for the reality of faith to come into being. And the only way that faith can come into being is through action, doing something. You see, you can have faith as big as a mountain, but unless you show your faith by what you do, it is just a thought, it's just an idea. Faith is the giver to hope. Faith says this to hope, I see what is promised. And now I will move to it. Faith is a journey. And in Mary's case, the journey of faith is absolutely wonderful. It's incredible. And so this morning, that's what I want to look at, Mary's faith. And how sometimes it parallels with our faith in this journey called life. So turn to Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 29 in your Bibles, or you can look on the screen if you wish. Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 29. And it says this, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel 
appeared to her and said, Greetings, favoured woman, the Lord is with you. And here's what I want you to look at this morning. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Do you know that sometimes when God speaks to us, we become those two things or experience those two things, confused and disturbed. Disturbed means this. It means to be greatly troubled, greatly agitated, nervous, anxious. Have you ever been disturbed in any case? Sometimes God will speak to us and he'll say, I want you to do this. And inside us, there's this, oh, I don't know about that. I don't know if I, don't know if I can do that, you know. Or nervous, that, that nervousness that we get sometimes. I remember the first time that I told Pastor Pavey that I liked her. I was a little bit nervous, a little bit anxious. And we pulled up outside Goodness Special School. And I thought, well, it can't get any better than this. And I said, I like you. And she said, I like you too. I was a little bit disturbed. She was a little bit confused. But it was pretty plain what was going to happen then. How many weeks later did we get married? Only 12 weeks later. Yeah, well, if you find a good thing, let's go for it, brother. Let's not hang around. Let's not make any mistakes about it. Let me give you an example about being disturbed and confused even just this week. Emma, our beautiful daughter-in-law, decorated her parents' home with wonderful Christmas lights. There was baby Jesus and Moses and Mary and the lights were flashing and she sent us a picture and I went, that is outstanding. It's just really, really beautiful. So I said to Pavey and I said to Paul, let's go and have a look at the lights that Emma's done. So they go, yeah. So we jumped in the car. Paul's driving. I'm at the front. Pavey's in the back and we're driving along. And then someone said, oh, just be careful when you hear, oh, oh, we could look at other Christmas lights. Ah, oh, in my mind, I'm thinking we are going to be driving around for days looking at Christmas lights. I became very disturbed. I was very anxious. I was nervous of what was going to happen. Disturbed, folks. Why can't, why can't we just go and do one thing? It's like shopping. I need a sh new shirt. Where do I go? I go to the shirt section of Myers and I look and I go, that's the one, and then I'm out of there. Oh, so disturbed. So we saw the lights, it was beautiful. And then Pavey said, now Pavey is great with directions, okay? And she is just incredible. She's very, very good. We jump in the car and Pavey said, let's go down this way. Hmm, why are we going down this way? I had never been that way before. So, and as we're driving, she goes, oh, it's just around here. And I'm telling you, I was confused. I didn't know where I was going. And I actually started to feel a little bit dizzy because we're going around like this. Not only am I disturbed, but I'm confused. I don't know where I'm going. And then that person over there said, Maybe we can get a McFlurry as well on our journey seeing the Christmas lights. Mm, I just want to see one set of lights and I just want to go home and lie down and relax. No, so we had to go and see all these lights in a state of being disturbed and confused and filled with ch chocolate and ice cream. That, folks, is what it's like to be disturbed and confused. Very simple. I was very anxious and I was very, very disturbed. I had never been this way before. When God calls us to do something great for him, I can guarantee you to some degree, you're going to be disturbed, you're going to be anxious, agitated, and you're going to be confused. 
this isn't the way that I thought that God would take us. This isn't the way that I thought that God wanted me to do this. You see, when God calls you to do something, it starts off with such great excitement. But in the journey, you can experience being disturbed. Because God is taking you to a place that you've never been before. That is the whole you know, power of faith. It moves you from where you are to where God wants you to be. And right throughout Christianity, multitudes of people have been on a journey when they have never known where they're going to go or how they're going to go. God calls people from one nation to another nation where he, he, he puts them in a culture where they don't even know the language. They don't understand all the nuances. But God is doing something great in your life when you're, you're in that place of being disturbed and confused. And why does he do that? Why did he do that to Mary? What is the whole point of God taking you on a place where you, you go to something different? It's because he wants to make sure that your faith does not rest in man's wisdom, but in God's power to deliver you. Mary is confused and she's disturbed. Look at another part of the scripture there. It says this, Luke 1, 30a. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her. Don't be afraid. Now, how did the angel know that Mary was afraid? He looked at her and maybe she was shaking. Maybe she was crying. Maybe she had that look of on her face. And the angel says, don't be afraid. You see, there will be fear in the journey of faith. You can be fearful in the journey of faith because that's the reality. You're going to a place that you didn't know. Faith is often accompanied with fear. They don't walk hand in hand, but I'm telling you folks, they walk side by side. Because God is wanting you to move in faith, but the enemy, he wants you to stop and to have fear. Because he doesn't want you to move to that place of faith that God is taking you. And you will have that experience of faith with, yes, yes, I can. And fear, no, no, I can't. And you have a moment there where you need to choose something. You see, God didn't give you the spirit of fear, but he gave you the spirit of power, love, and a soundness of mind. The enemy puts fear in you. And the enemy wants to stop you from moving forward. He will come and say all sorts of things to you. Like, oh, you don't have the capacity for that. You'll never be able to go back to school and study or university and do your master's and then do another set of master's and then become a doctor. He'll whisper to you. And God, by the Holy Spirit, is saying, move forward, keep going, don't stop. And here is Mary in this state. You see, the devil hates God. He hates him. He wanted to be God. He wanted to take over. And the reason why he comes to you and tries to stop you is because you are made in the image of God. And so he can't get to God because God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-present. But I tell you what, he can come and whisper in your ear. You'll never do it. You'll never make it. Why bother starting now? But God is there and he's spurring us on to move by faith. Many great men and women have been afraid. Adam was afraid and he hid. Sarah was afraid because she laughed. Elijah was afraid and he ran away. Jacob was afraid. Mary was afraid. Pastor Jim was afraid. Let me tell you my fear story. I've told it before, but I will tell it again. Because it's a good story. And I'm kind of like Paul. I have no problem in telling you a story again and again and again. When we started to build this building, it took many years to get permission to start to build. We spent everything that we had and we were waiting for the banks 
to approve the money. We were ready to go, but we didn't have any money. But our builder, David Harney, a man of great faith, he said, we're going to start the foundations. We're going to start to drill. And I said, we don't have any money. We've got nothing, not a zip, none, nothing. There's nothing in the bank. And he said, don't worry, have a little faith. And I said, have a little faith. Who do you think they're going to come looking for, for the money when they want to be paid after the drilling? Not me, Pastor Pavey, because I'm out of here, brother. <laughs> he said, don't worry, have a little bit of faith. Have a little bit of faith. I thought he was going to start to sing, don't worry, be happy. I said, I'm not, he's a dumb dwarf. Happy is a dumb dwarf. How can you be happy all the time? He's just a dwarf. Man, he said, have a little faith. Having spent all that we had, having spent everything that you have, what do you do? You go and touch the hem of his garment. You say, like, Jesus, please, please speak to the bank manager. Please, God. And as sure as I'm, I'm here, as they started to drill, guess what happened? The bank rang me up, the representative, and he asked me this question. And I had answered, I am not exaggerating, maybe 50 questions about our church. He said, I believe that you're moving from where you are to where you want to go. I said, yes, we are, because we were in a school. He said, well, how far is it? How do you know that the people won't come where you're going? I said, it's 700 meters down the road. <laughs> 700 meters. Are you telling me they can't drive from there to here? Man, I was so angry. And I said to the bank representative, I said this, tell them to keep the money. What did I say? If they don't approve it by this afternoon, I don't know where those words came from, but they came out because I was just so angry. Keep your money. And they're drilling holes. Keep the money. That was supposed to be the inside voice, not the outside voice. Have you ever said something and you wished you had never said it? Yeah. yeah. And I hung up the phone. And that afternoon, the bank ran back. The guy, he said, you got the money. Oh, oh what a wait. Oh, and now we had a loan for lots of money. Ah, oh, another, another wait. Another way. God, we've got no money. Touch the hem of his garment. Mary was afraid. Do you know why she was afraid? Because an angel said something that was so unbelievable. Fear wants to eat your faith. But faith acted upon will annihilate fear every time. You just have to be brave and you have to start moving. And God will move with you. Here's the second part of that verse. It says, do not be afraid, for you have found favor with God. Do you know what happens? Sometimes God speaks to us and we don't hear everything that he says. Now, this is the second time that the angel has said favor to her. He said it to her, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. But then again, later on, he says this in verse 30, for you have found favor with God. What is favor with God? What is the reality of favor with God? Well, it simply means this. Listen, God stepping into your situation to make a difference. You have favor with God. Every step that Mary took from that moment on was going to change her life. She was going to become pregnant by the Holy Spirit. She had some challenges to face. First, she had to go and tell Joseph, the man she's engaged to, to be married. Uh, Joseph, got some news for you. Maybe not going to like this. Then she had to deal with her parents, maybe a brother and a sister, an uncle. 
the wider community, all the shame, the religious people looking down her nose at her because she's praying. She had a whole stack of things going on. But the angel said to her, God has found favor with you in your life. That is the starting point of when we turn from fear to faith and make it a reality. When we realize that we have favor with God. You have favor with God. When Alex and Jackie were little, about seven and five, you know, kids ask you some strange questions when they're small. And so Alex came and he said, which one's your favorite? Is it me or is it Jackie? And I said, Alex, you're my favorite. And he went, oh. So he toddled off. And I wonder where he went. He went to tell his sister. And he probably went up there and said, Jackie, I'm the favorite. <laughs> and just toddled on off. Well, a few moments later, guess who arrived in front of me? Jackie. She said, Dad, who's your favorite? And I said, Jackie, <laughs> I told Alex he was my favorite, but you're my favorite. <laughs> this is such a joke in our house that even last week, when someone was talking about favorite, I turned to look at Alex and I just went, and he went, <laughs> who's the favorite? They're both my favorite. They're both my favorite. Does God favor one person over another? This is a question for the congregation this morning. Does God favor one person over another? No, because the scripture tells us this in Romans chapter 2 verse 11. God does not show favoritism. He doesn't. You're his favorite. Everyone stand up. Come on. This is an action, church. Put your hand on your heart. Point up to heaven and say this. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. I am your favorite. Right, sit down. That means God will step into your situation to make a difference when you start to what? Walk by faith. You're his favorite. I can't wait for my grandkids to, to grow up. They are in for some treat with grandpa. Sammy, come in. Who's your favorite grandpa? You are, mate. And he'll run off and tell Sophie. And Sophie will come back and say, Grandpa, who's your favorite? I'll say, Sophie, you're my favorite. And then they'll both come and they'll go, we don't believe you. But that's all right. I can't wait till they start talking and reasoning. <laughs> it's going to be great. I am favored. Do you know, this was the switch for Mary. When the angel had told her not once but twice, you're favored by God. God will step into your situation. God will start to move with you. He'll start to make a way that no one can make a way for. He'll open doors that need to be opened. He'll close doors that no one could ever close because I don't want you to do this certain thing. He has favorites. So the journey of Mary started with being confused, being disturbed, and being afraid. In what is the most monumental event of the beginning of Christ coming to this world. And then Mary goes, what's, what's now? And this is what the angel says. He says, the Holy Spirit says that you will be conceived by him. You will give birth to a son. You will call his name Jesus. He will be great. He will be the son of the most high. He will have the throne of the ancestor David. And he will reign over Israel and his kingdom will never ever end. Now that's a lot for a girl to take on. That's a lot. But he says that to her. 
And then she says, whew, amazing. Whew. If you think about it, when God asks you to do something monumental, what do you do? What's a girl supposed to do in a situation like that? So he tells her all these things. He's going to be called the son of the most high. He's, he's from the, the throne of David. He's going to rule this, this world and this kingdom. What's a girl to do? I think in that moment, you know, I can imagine Mary like this and the angel before her. And then in that moment when he says all these things, there's silence. There's a, not a pregnant pause, but a pre-pregnant pause. A moment. Of silence, and she's looking at Gabriel, and Gabriel's looking at her. And this is what she says. It is probably one of the greatest confessions that we read in the Bible. That at that moment, think about this, humanity was hanging by a thread. That the Savior would come to the world on a little girl, on a woman. How is she going to respond? How are you going to respond? When other people's lives are so important to come to Christ and to know him. How will you respond when the moment of faith comes to you? When God calls you to do something? This is what she said. Luke 1, 38. I am the Lord's servant. I'm the Lord's servant. And then she says this. May everything you have said about me come true. And do you know what comes after that? The angel left. And she's by herself. May everything that you have said about me, me, your servant, let it come true. And at that moment, folks, the destiny of your life was changed. Your life was changed because Christ came into the world. Do you know when you respond by faith in a situation that God calls you to, not only does your life change, but other people's lives change too. You are in the great link of faith. And we must respond every time that God calls us to do something. Yes, there's going to be fear. Yes, you're going to feel confused. Yes, you're going to feel that disturbed feeling in your heart. But unless you respond by faith, lives are lost. And he will make a way for you. And he will favor you. He will step into your situation if you respond by faith. You know, when I'm preparing a message and I'm, I'm trying to connect what God has put in my heart, I'm trying to draw on everything that I know possible. And so I'm saying, God, what, what is it in this? Not for me, but for those who would hear me. And I really sensed that God was saying, I want my people to respond by faith when he calls, when I call upon them to respond. When I ask them to do something that is beyond their own capability. And I believe that even now that God is calling you to do something that God has dropped in your heart, maybe not from an angel, maybe an impression from the Holy Spirit or a sense of direction or you've read the word of God and you see something and it, it's so tangible to you and then all of a sudden, bang, there's that moment, that moment when you go through emotions of fear, being disturbed, you're anxious and you're going, I don't know if I can. Let me tell you folks, you can because if God is for you, then who would be dumb enough to be against you? God is there. He's there every part of your journey. And you've just got to take that breath and go, I am your servant. Let everything that you have said, may it come to me. I want you to stand this morning. And I hope you hear my heart. I hope you understand what I'm saying to you. I know that there are people here this morning that God is calling them to do something that is beyond them. And that 
is faith. Mary moved into a place of so much uncertainty. But God gave a favor and he will give you favor too. As you take that step of faith and say, yes, Lord. I want every eye closed this morning and every head bowed. Because this journey of faith is so powerful and is so real and so incredible. But you know, this journey is so deeply personal. Deeply personal. And if God the Holy Spirit has been speaking to you to step out in an area of faith, I don't know if it's the job, I don't know if it's study, I don't know if it's sharing your faith, I don't know... You know, if it's serving, if it's a call to ministry, if it's a call to a deeper sense of prayer, I don't know. But I know that God is calling on us to respond by faith. And if that's you, why don't you raise your hand this morning and you're saying, yes, Lord, I know, I know, I know it's me. You know, there are hands that are raised all over this place. All over this place. Now put your hand down. I'm going to pray for you as you've responded this morning. Because I know the reality of the beginning of that step of faith. I know what it's like. But I tell you what, when you come outside of that step of faith out of that first step I tell you what man it's so powerful it is for this reason this purpose that I was born and made this is part of the purpose you, there's nothing like it when you listen to his voice and obey there's a peace and there's a joy Father God for every hand that was raised this morning to respond by faith what you were called them to I pray by the power of the Holy Spirit Lord that they would have a revelation that they are favored that you step into the situation regardless of where they are and you change their destiny and Lord they not only change their destiny but Lord someone else is counting on them to take that step of faith. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you, Holy Spirit. That you're speaking, you're leading, you're guiding, you're directing, and we do not have to fear God. But you are with us all the days of our life. I am the Lord's servant. Let everything happen as you have said. In Jesus' name, amen. Now let me tell you, if there is one thing that you need to do, now that you've made that decision in your mind and in your heart, you need to tell someone. You need to say, hey, I feel that God is going to do this with me. You need to tell someone. You know, we have that scripture. It says in Romans chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, that if we confess with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is Lord, we shall be saved. Do you know the power of confession? If you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and the things that he's called you to, you start to set things in motion also. Jesus is Lord. It's not just of our soul but of, 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 and our spirit, but of our whole life. And we want him to be Lord of our life. Totally. So speak to someone. Go to someone that you can trust, someone who will encourage you in your walk of faith and say, I, I feel, I sense that this is what God is saying to me. And then pray together. Make yourself accountable to someone. 
We've only got one life. Let's make it count for Him. Amen. Amen.